Our next speaker is the chair of the symposium, Dr. Marcus Covert, uh, director of the Animal Discovery Center at Stanford and associate professor of bioengineering. Marcus. Thanks. First of all, thank you so much, everybody who came to speak. Like uh, for me, this is like my hall of fame. I really am deeply inspired by the people who've come. So for those of you who, who did that and made the trip, uh, I love it. I'm just kind of, someone asked me if I was going to say anything in the beginning. And I said, no, I'm just going to silently giggle while everyone talks, which is basically what I've been doing. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, OK. So our center has been doing a lot of things. I'm going to focus on one thing. We've got this next really big rollout in terms of the whole cell modeling that we've been doing. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be out by the end of the year. I'm really, really excited about it, and I want to share it with you. Mark uh, gave us that quote from Box Hunter and Hunter, this, um, <clears throat> this idea all models are wrong, some are useful. The kind of funny thing and the uncomfortable truth is that really all data is wrong and some is useful, right? <laughs> So people don't want to get, go there, right? But it's actually the truth. And as it's very hard for us to come up with methods to look at that data and what it means. People are worried even about reproducibility. Uh, but there's something deeper there, which is really the cross-verifiability. Like, how much does all of the data that we have on an organism, how consistent is it? Right? How correct is it? And um, it's really easy to take pot shots at models, but I think getting at the data only by kind of recognizing that about what we're generating on the data side, are we going to have any chance of trying to get at what the truth actually is? So what we're doing is we are pulling together all of the data uh, with respect to E. coli, data that's been generated in these papers, you know, many decades, hundreds of labs, independently generated, millions of data points. Okay, and these things all, the question is really how can we evaluate them against each other? How can we think about what the totality is? They're heterogeneous, as we show here. The way that we're trying to bring them together is by encapsulating them in equations, right? So if you go in and you write 4,500 equations about the RNAs, the specific RNAs in the cell, that brings a bunch of this data together. The same thing with the metabolites in the cell, right? You can write another. 1,500 equations that govern the concentrations of all the small molecules in the cell. You can do the same thing with the proteins. And now in this way, you've wrapped that data in. You've pulled it in so that it can be drawn together. And we are fortunate to have this kind of whole cell modeling framework where we bring these things together in the different processes that they fall into. And by then describing how those processes interact, we can start to generate simulations that can be uh, predictive of behavior, but more importantly, they can help us to understand how those data interact, where they're correct and where they're incorrect. So just to make that a little bit more clear, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to go to 38. <laughs> I felt kind of bad because uh, uh, someone said 38 sounds like a lot, and I'm like, okay, well, now I'm going to sound way worse. The, um, the, here are all the different kinds of data that we were taking. Okay, and that's, those color codes are important. We used all of that data to identify about 19,000 parameters from the literature and then put those into these equations. And you can see from the color coding how they fit together in those equations. Okay, and then you can put that together in our model. As I said, you can use that to run simulations. I'll show something dynamic. So here you see one of our simulations. I'm just showing you a few channels. This is kind of fanciful, but whatever. So this is E. coli growing in a, in a minimal environment. You can see it growing out, dividing. It's making DNA there. OK, and you have these things. So we, we had a model. This is not a, a whole cell model in the same sense uh, our earlier paper claimed to be. It only, it, we call it our half cell model. It represents about half of the functionally annotated genes. Uh, and, but it has a lot of advantages that our previous didn't have. It's stable across generations. It can run on a laptop in 10 minutes in Python, whereas our previous one used a cluster for 10 hours. So there's a lot of big improvements that have been made here. And it can do shifts, which is pretty fun. We're moving here to a nutrient-rich environment. You can see what's going to happen here are a bunch of sensors are going to get triggered. Okay, As a result of that, gene expression is going to change. You're going to see some circles get bigger and smaller. Uh, the concentration of metabolites is going to change. All of that is going to contribute to producing more ribosomes. And then as you go into that new environment, the sensors trigger. You see all these changes happening. Now the cells are getting bigger, fatter. They're growing and dividing faster. And they're even starting a parallel process, their, uh, their replication of the chromosomes. right? 
So a lot of action going on in there, and we finally got this to a place where we can start looking at what it's going to tell us. There are several different things I just already told you. Um, but I want to introduce this concept to you, getting back to this question of data, right? Our previous model was with parameters taken from all kinds of organisms, but E. coli is so well characterized that this is 100% E. coli parameters, which means we can really compare it all against itself. It's the first time. Uh, so we've got this concept called deep curation, and I think it's an important thing to think about, uh, especially as people start looking at curating data more deeply. In this case, deep is analogous to deep, deep sequencing or maybe even more to deep learning. The idea is that there are layers, okay? They're not only this, the individual points, but the interactions between them, and then the interactions between the interactions, and so on down. That's very important. So I'm going to show you the same thing that I'm going through. Whew, quick breath, because I'm going like a mile a minute just to cover all this. Um, so think about the layers and what I showed you here. You've, of course, got the raw data layer, OK? But then you've got a parameter layer, which really is derived from the data, right? It's, it's in some ways a model of the data, a reduced representation of the data. Then you've got an equation layer. And what I really like about some of the talks that we've heard today is that it emphasizes this idea that equation is also curation. It's curation of mechanism. And that's what's missing from any deep learning or AI-based modeling of a system like this. We curate the mechanism. OK, so now you put those things together in a unified model, and you use it to run simulations. And all of a sudden, something really important happens, which is that every single piece of raw data up here is connected deeply, right? It's connected directly but deeply to every other piece of data that you brought in. They're all connected together. So you can start to say, how, what's the friction between them? How much one matters versus the other? And it's the kind of stuff where we're just generating methods on the fly because we've never been in a place like this before. It's been really fun to just ask this question, what do we get from all this? What can we learn from the data as a totality that we couldn't learn from anything else? I've got a ton to say. I'm going to go as fast as I can. <laughs> But uh, I'd love to talk more about any of it. It's super exciting to me, and I'm really craving the feedback. This is the first time I've talked about this in this way. Um, so in our case, once we had all those, those parameters, that model, I should just say, someone asked before, how much of it is changed or fit? Zero right now. Okay? So we just took all of the parameters from the literature. Okay? We brought them together, and we wanted to see how well could that predict the doubling time of the cell under given conditions, predict 22 fluxes that have been measured, metabolic fluxes, predict the proteome. How, how well could that represent these data that had been withheld? So first thing we see right away, there is parameter friction, right? So when you put these together in a simulation, the known doubling time for glucose M9 media, right, is about under around 45 minutes. Over here we have something that's like two or three times as large, right? So right away, we can see that there's friction between the data. They can't all be correct, okay, which I think we'd all recognize. But now we can start to, start to answer the question, why? We can do the kind of experiments you would never do in a million years experimentally. So what we did is we ran 20,000 simulations. Every time, we changed 10% of the parameters, okay, moving them five-fold up or five-fold down, all randomly, and saw what the difference was in the growth rate. And then we just said, OK, which of these, which of the factors, which of the possible parameters just shows up the most in the ones that are impacted the most? Okay? We had to do 10% because they're so interconnected. right? There's a lot of stuff that goes together to make a change. So these tails represent the answers to that question. And the first thing that shows up, you'll see a lot of R, RRs and RPOs. Those are the ribosomal subunits and the RNA polymerase subunits. Okay, so that's a pretty obvious, straightforward answer. I think many people would have guessed that. There's some other surprises, which we'll talk about in a minute. But sure enough, we can go back and we can look at, okay, let's take a look. And I don't have time to go. We went through probably 30 or 40 different data sets trying to find, okay, which one has the least independent con um, confirmation, which one is, the, um, is estimated instead of like actually measured. And we went in and found factors that we could move such that you know, we could come up with a reasonable um, approximation of the parameters that we had that would give us reasonable growth rates. Does that make sense? 
This one's a little more interesting. We also found several metabolic enzymes that had a, a, an outsized impact on the growth rate. And it could have been for any reason. It could have been their kinetics, could have been their expression, could have been a bunch of other stuff. Um, but you had this discrepancy. And so when we started comparing the, both the doubling time results with these comparisons to the fluxome, what we saw was that there were also some important outliers in that network, right? There are certain areas of friction, and you can see them here. So we can do something very similar. We can go in and we can say, okay, we're going to look and see what all we can change, and in this case it's just one at a time, see what we can change that will make some impact on this metabolic network, right? That will actually give us more agreement with this uh, flux distribution. We had a bunch of candidates. What gets really exciting, and this now I'm going straight back to Box Hunter and Hunter <laughs> again, which is one of my favorite books, uh, where they wrote a book about statistical design of experiments, right? The problem is as you get into biology, this can be very difficult because you can't do this like rigorous statistical design of a whole bunch of experiments. But in the simulations, you can. So we took our major players from here. We threw them into a full factorial two-level design, right? Ran all of the simulations looking for simulation groups where certain parameters had been removed to see which parameter sets would give us a growth rate that was reasonable and a flux distribution that kind of matched what we had. And we saw that in every case, there were four sets of kinetic parameters that had to be removed from the model or, or opened up, as Mark said, right? Opened up to be very broad. So that's like pretty amazing, right? You're talking about probably thousands of parameters that we're considering together that, that all impinge on this thing. And it brings us down to these four that really are kind of the main, the main culprits in that parameter friction. So what that enabled us to do is then rerun the model. And this is kind of fun because I'll just put this all up for speed's sake. Um, you can take what the old model had for a distribution of a certain kinetic parameter. You can take what the new model had. And then you can take what the measurement was. Okay? And what you see is like over in this case, the old and new model were fairly similar. And they're close to the measurement. Right? It makes sense because we're using those kinetic parameters. In other cases, what's interesting is that the new model actually has a much closer connection. Uh, the new distribution has a much closer connection to the measurements, even in these cases in which now we removed those kinetic parameters, right? You can see, most interesting to me is this one over here, where you have four different measurements, and the new model clearly captures that variability much more accurately than what had been known before. So that's pretty exciting uh, thing for me. The resulting uh, new additions, removing those constraints, opening up those values basically, leads us to doubling times that still connect to a flux distribution that's also reasonable. And uh, what's really interesting then is that we can compare uh, how well the models kind of target kinetics based on kinetic data that's been taken from the uh, from the literature, how well that matches with what the simulation is actually providing. And it's, um, it's pretty amazing. OK, last thing. Uh, there was a big surprise in here, for me at least, CDSA. Uh, CDSA is a lipid biosynthesis metabolic enzyme. But it shows up like as being essentially as important to, this, uh, to the growth of this cell as the ribosomes and the RNA polymerases. So for me, that was a uh, shock. Uh, actually, before I saw that, I had a full head of hair. <laughs> Just kidding. But, the, uh, but yes, so we saw CDSA and wondered what that was. It was really striking. Uh, ignore the top two genes for now. Uh, just for speed's sake, it was really striking because like our own data and other people's data had shown that it basically wasn't getting expressed at the mRNA level. Uh, the protein showed a low but non-zero amount of, um, of protein, but you know, we didn't use, this was in our withheld data, our validation data set, which I'll show you in a minute. And it was also shown to be an essential gene. Right? So this is a place of a lot of friction right, in our model. There's like, you see these big, important data sets, these two of which had been withheld. Right? And they're, they're all basically uh, pointing us to this idea that there's this essential gene that's not being expressed. And so uh, 
ignore this one, it's to the other story. But this one, we went in even with qPCR to try to make sure that it really wasn't being expressed. And sure enough, it's basically not being expressed. Um, so the answer, the solution to that problem came about as we compared it to the, prote to the proteome. Uh, what you can see here is uh, this is what was measured in the independent data set. This is what was simulated. You can see it's a very nice uh, correlation with the exception of this low stuff, which we've touched on in other talks, right? The lower, got it. Um, so if you look at that data another way, what you see is that um, you, can, you can actually look at outliers. And it kind of raised our attention, just to make a long story short, that one of the biggest problems in our model were the protein decay rates. By and large, they're not measured, right? And we just heard a talk about how important they can be. Usually when people think about protein decay rates, they're thinking about the end rule, which came from a science paper several decades ago in which people thought based on the sequence of the peptide chain and a protein, you could, especially at the end, you could determine that its decay rate would either be two minutes or 10 hours essentially based on a couple of, of quick rules. And in most cases, like you can see here, in most cases that turns out to be right and pretty predictive. But in several cases there were outliers, and so we had already taken a look at what the model predicted some outliers should be, and we in fact had verified that, that the model, the, the, let's say the rest of the world's data is a better predictor of what the protein half-life should be than the, um, than the NN rule. But uh, after looking at all this stuff, at one point I thought, well, where does CDSA fall on this graph? Okay, and it turns out to fall right over there. It's thought to have a two-minute half-life, right? So very unstable protein. And, um, and so this was great. We had a chance, a, a, a big testable prediction to resolve potentially many of the frictions in the model. And so it turns out CDSA is a membrane protein, which makes it a total hassle to look at with a Western blot, which is what these are. But just this week, we used IF to be able to look at this. Okay? And so here you're looking at a true short-lived protein. You can see that the fluorescence dies out right after a few minutes. Okay? This is what CDSA should look like. But if you look up there, what you'll see is what it does look like. Okay? So that's a massive kind of new discovery catalyzed by the model that resolves a major discrepancy that translates all the way to physiology. Why I want to show you this is because I want you to see, again, that deep curation idea, right? You wouldn't think that the half-life of the CDSA protein is somehow translating to all of these other things and having such an outside impact on everything else, but it is. It just isn't doing it in this superficial way. It's doing it in this deep way. That's what I wanted to get at. I'll just close with that. The model is now totally in release. Anybody can download it. It's in Python. Runs 10 minutes on a laptop. We're totally happy to help you. We've even had people just come sit in the lab uh, from other places and hang out with us because we love that. And uh, so anyway, I hope people will try it out. And then finally, very last thing. Uh, I wasn't going to put this in, but because of uh, Netta's great talk, we're starting a lot to think about uh, agent-based modeling and how to integrate those two things. I would love to see a very detailed mechanistic model of a tumor. This is very much first in kind. So what you're looking at is now every one of these things put in this like kind of in silico colony is running an instantiation of a whole cell model. They can interact together. They can control the environment. They can respond to the environment. We can only do 12 cells right now <laughs> until we're maxed out. But we're, uh, we, uh, right now, as we speak, my, one of my software team is demonstrating how we, uh, he's put this on the cloud, which means in very short order we'll be able to do thousands. So very excited about that. Anyway, a huge team had to put this together. Those names are just the names of people who contributed to everything that you saw. But uh, part of the center, it's just been great working with them and a real privilege. Thank you. And I'll take any questions. Questions? Uh, down in front? Or Mark, would you like to? Yes. That was a great talk. Oh, I'm thanks. looking forward to playing with it. Um, so I, something you said was surprising. You took all E. coli data 
and used it and it was able to divide and replicate. That's surprising given what you're saying that there's errors in data that your, your simulations would even converge unless you did some sort of data quality yeah, fresh, like right. filtering or something? So yes, uh, for, for political reasons, I don't often just go after all the data that we like and don't like, but there are definitely data, there's a lot of QC that goes in, not just whether or not it's gonna fit in the model, but often we look at each data set itself to see how self-consistent it is, and, and sometimes we'll contact the people who generated that data with questions. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into that, like a staggering amount of, of that. Then also, the methods that we use, the whole cell modeling methods, they're a bit more forgiving. Like if this was one big set of ODEs, which is kind of, I, I guess I showed it a little too much like that, it's softer than that. It should be the, there's a lot of um, stochasticity and also a lot of optimization that runs in the background that helps us to have a little bit of give. You know, it's kind of like the, the, the oil that lubes the whole process. If it was a totally straight ODEs only, it wouldn't run for sure. Yeah, because of that friction. In the back? Oh. Well, let's have you do it too, but there is somebody in the back. You go ahead while, okay. while he's getting um, it. So follow up to this question. Uh, were you able to automatically identify uh, suspect data or lower quality data, or did you have to do it all manually? Uh, yeah, it's tough. I, I tell, uh, we want to be able to, uh, yeah, right, <laughs> what am I doing? We want to be able to build Hondas, but right now we have to try to build something more like a Ferrari. There's just like a ton of hand work that goes into everything. So like the metabolic network, um, you know, there's a database, Brenda, that houses tons of parameters. Um, about 20 to 30% of those have been estimated to be incorrect. And I actually, one summer, I went through 10,000 papers and read 1,000 of them to do the same thing. This is me, myself, so just imagine what the lab is doing. But the most common error, so I also came up with that 20% number, uh, but didn't publish it, it's, it is published. But the most common error is to mistake a micro for a milla and vice versa, <laughs> right? So, so to me, that's enough to just say you can't. Like, if you're gonna be off by a thousand fold, 20% of the time, you gotta go in by yourself. That's just the unfortunate rule, right? So, so now let's talk about the lies that bioinformatics tells. <laughs> yes, two truths and a lie. Yes? Um, I was curious about, so in a lot of experimental systems or model systems, you see a disconnect between, like, so if you do proteomic analysis or whatever, you're essentially smashing everything apart and just taking a global concentration. But when you're working with it in a model or in the biological system in the space, sometimes there are dimensionality constraints where, say, uh, there are chaperones involved, or uh, which essentially change the, by changing the dimensionality, they change the, the reaction kinetics as mm -hmm. to how, how accessible that model or what the local concentration is. And have you found, with your model, any ability to kind of figure out or, or project maybe potential dimensionality of, of the, for subsets of proteins or anything, or? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think a lot of that will come up. So, right, when I watch Mark's talk or Mary's talk, right, I'm super excited because the whole time I'm sitting there like squinting at their equate, not to feel too, uh, you know, I don't want you guys to feel data stalked or anything, but the, uh, but I'm, I'm watching those things because this I feel like is the next phase. We've pulled in some modeling, but I really want us to start to bring in these detailed in-depth models that people have done. A lot of what we've leaned on so far has been global data, right? But something like, I mean, you cannot put a price on dynamics, right, on single cell resolution. In fact, when as a center, we also develop experimental technologies, and that's always the focus. Like we want, so these kinase translocation reporters that Peter showed, right? We invented those purely because we wanted something that would be single cell resolved and dynamic. Because other than that, we don't really have a chance to get at those kinds of things that you're saying. But I think we will in the future. Like I, I feel optimistic. Okay, thank you so much.